What I thought um, I'd look at this evening is um, I'd look at this question that I've, I've had over the years, which is, what do I do about my personality? Um, and I'm going to start with a quote from the book that I quoted last night, Mother of Knowledge, from the Darkney Yeshe, Yeshe Sogyal. She's, um, she's actually, she's meditating in solitary retreat. She's in, she's in a cave. And she, she, at this point in the story, she sort of hit a moment of, um, oh, when will this end? <laughs> you know, sometimes we have this on retreat that it just seems like it goes on forever and um, we're kind of getting worse. And there's a point where she sort of seems to just give up in a way her personality. She says, from the beginning, I have given my body to the Lama. Whatever will happen, happiness or misery, the Lama knows. From the beginning, I have given my speech to the pure Dharma. Whether my breath will continue to flow or not, only you now know. From the beginning, I have directed my mind towards virtue. Whether it is virtuous or not, only you now know. Um, so when I came across the Dharma um, when I was, uh, I, I was 17, I had this question about who do I want to be? And of course, that's quite a familiar question to us all at that age. You know, we're just discovering our adult personality and um, wondering um, who we're going to be in life. Uh, looking around us, I remember looking around at slightly older people thinking, you know, oh, I like her, do I want to be like that? You know, what is it about her that I like? And in a way, what, what can I take on of that person? And when I came across the Dharma, I remember listening to these talks, actually. I listened, um, I listened to all Bhante's talks uh, when I was meant to be data inputting um, uh, for my job, um, you know, my sort of extra job, if you see what I mean. I remember data inputting and just listening to all these lectures. And I remember um, listening to The Taste of Freedom and coming to this part where Bhante's talking about habit as one of the fetters saying that we're, that all we are, all our personality is, is a habit that a certain stream of consciousness has got into. And he recommends getting out of the habit. He says, it's only a habit that you've got into. You don't have to be the way you are. There's no necessity about it. And he talks about becoming a true individual, being continually aware, emotionally positive, continually responsible, sensitive and creative continually creative of our, one's own self. So here I was as a teenager, um, hearing that my personality was just a habit that I got into and um, I could get out of it. I could, um, even taking on that language of spiritual death, I could just let that old personality die, become whoever I wanted to be, um, become someone completely new. And I think I took it a little bit literally, and I think part of that was based on a, a, you know, a dislike of myself, a certain harshness towards myself. I wouldn't say self say, say self hatred. I don't think it was that far. I think it was just more like there were aspects of myself that I didn't like, and they loomed larger in my consciousness than the aspects of myself that I did like. So here I was, um, not quite liking myself, wanting to be someone different feeling quite unconfident in certain ways. And this teaching of, of um, anatta, of, of no fixed self, spiritual death, and this message to get rid of the old self and replace it by a new self. But what, I, what happened was that no matter how hard I tried, I kept on finding my old habits coming up again and again. Um, it's like I tried to sort of squeeze this personality that I didn't quite like about myself into a box and push it away, but it kept on kind of popping out. It was like trying to put a balloon in a box. It just sort of squeezed out in, other, in, other, in, the, in the sides. And I couldn't quite get rid of it, no matter how hard I tried. You know, and I'd do things like go traveling or uh, I'd think, right, I'm gonna be someone completely different. And of course I was for about a day and then <laughs> I just remained again and again, the old things coming up. And I remember, um, you know, I like to go on retreat um, on my own without any friends uh, because then I could just be someone new on retreat. But by the end of the retreat, I was still the same personality. It wasn't like 
I just transplanted my personality to someone different. And um, I sort of remembered this experience in the lockdown because I think um, for myself, like many other people, uh, in during the lockdown, things resurfaced about myself that I thought I'd buried long ago. And I was quite ashamed of that, actually. Um, you know, I thought, well, here I am. I've been practicing for many years um, very wholeheartedly. And how is it that these tendencies that I thought I'd got rid of um, just seem to come up much, much bigger under the stress of the lockdown? Um, and I got into this kind of flight response that was very, very familiar to me from childhood and a kind of pervasive unhappiness that I also remember from childhood. And in a way, I couldn't ignore those aspects of myself anymore. So going back to Panti's teaching on, on um, becoming an individual, his first piece of advice is to become um, more aware of oneself. In fact, there is a talk that he gives on becoming uh, a true individual where he goes into it in more depth. And he says one of the one of the characteristics of the individual is that you become uh, aware. He says you become aware of yourself. You become aware of your physical body, its positions, its movements. You're also aware of your emotions, whether positive or negative, and of your thoughts, of ideas, concepts, reflections, reasoning. You are aware of your conditioning too the extent to which you have been conditioned by your upbringing, your environment, your early experiences, your associations, your particular skills and tendencies, your likes and dislikes. You are aware of your own basic motivations. Essentially, you are aware of your own irreplaceable uniqueness. You are intensely, luminously aware. You feel the very vibration of your own individual existence. So instead of just trying to get rid of um, your own self, uh, your own personality, it's all about becoming more deeply aware of what our conditioning actually is, the extent that we've been conditioned by our upbringing, um, by our environment and early experiences. Um, being aware of what we can contribute and being aware of um, where we might put stress on other people. So I think that during the last uh, year or so, and um, particularly during the, the lockdown, I think I had to face my conditioning at a much deeper level, um, face my conditioning uh, from my family environment, from my culture, my education, um, face the conditioning that I've set up in myself through previous actions and look at that whole kind of picture of who I am and I say conditioning it's not causality because I think sometimes when we we think about our conditioning we we think it's just got one cause you know the cause of, of particularly um, our childhood experience but um, I think it's very important for me to realize that it's not just causality, like it's not all my mum's fault or something like that, or it's not all because of this, you know, one experience I had in my childhood. It's conditioning and conditioning is constant. It's happening all the time. We're constantly being shaped by our conditioning. And a lot of that is, um, is Vipaka, it's the fruit of previous actions, it's the fruit of, 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 of um, previous experiences. So who we are is a kind of momentary crystallization of all the conditions that have gone before. Um, and some of this is just, as I said, it's Vipaka, it's, it's happened, it's um, results of previous actions. Uh, you could also look at it as a lot of this is the mano nirma processes. Um, so if you remember the, the teaching on the nirmas, they're different levels of conditionality uh, that play out in, in the world and, and in our experience. And mano nirma processes are those that are to do with instinctual consciousness. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we have... Uh, uh, we have a certain part of our experience is, is instinct. Uh, a certain part of our personality is instinct. Um, previous actions, previous experiences have given rise to certain tendencies of mind. 
um, certain preferences under certain stimulus. So it's almost like um, a previous experiences and previous actions that we've undertaken. If you think about the wheel of life, sort of take you into um, how you experience the world and take you into a certain response, which is a kind of emotional groove that you've set up um, through previous experience. And it means that under certain stimulus, for example, the lockdown, um, you're going to end up uh, going into um, the same habitual tendencies, going into the same um, habitual tendencies that you've, you've gone in before. So we can experience the same thing, all of us, for example, the lockdown uh, and the pandemic, um, but all have our different responses. And our different responses to that are conditioned by previous experiences. So for me, under that situation of the lockdown, um, what I uh, experienced was a certain habit of aversion, uh, desire for flight, and a certain kind of heavy sort of despondency, um, uh, which was very, very painful to experience. But I could see how that habit have been set up by previous experiences. And I really needed to look at that. I needed to look at that sort of instinct, instinctual consciousness that I was getting into uh, because of this situation. And um, I looked at this, well, well, I mean, primarily through the help of, of my friends here at Tiratnaloka, um, who are very, very kind and supportive. And with the help of some therapy as well. Um, I had had some therapy before and I went back to the same therapist and she said yes you did need to come back because there's an aspect of things that um, you you need to look at more fully um, I, we also looked in the team at certain personality tests um, we looked at the Myers-Briggs personality test which is um, it's just quite helpful of seeing one's proclivities seeing one's preferences in experience that we all we all behave differently to certain stimulus um, and uh, have, a, have a different habitual response to the world set up by previous conditioning. Um, and what I realized I needed to look more fully at, um, at my conditioning was I needed a certain amount, first of all, of relaxation. I think it's very difficult to look at uh, one's character like that in some depth um, and and we need a bit of space around it we need a bit of space around it uh, and um, actually the community were very very generous about giving me the the space that I needed to look at that and I think the first thing I really needed to do and uh, realized I needed to do was just relax just relax I spent a long time lying uh, on the ground just grounding myself, just letting myself relax into my experience and see what needed to emerge rather than trying to push it away. It also needed a certain amount of kind attention um, and, uh, you know, a kindly awareness, a willingness to look at my experience, to look at my conditioning, to look at my personality uh, with kindness. Um, and, and a certain amount of forgiveness as well, forgiveness of myself, forgiveness of the conditions um, that I've experienced in my life. So first of all, there's just becoming aware of one's character. But there's also then um, this aspect of becoming an individual, which is about responsibility and taking responsibility uh, for mano niema processes. So this is something that Sabuti talks about he says, well, you may be, it may be that, that um, we're just conditioned in particular ways, but we have to realize that um, that does have an impact on other people. And um, in the end, what I realized is that I needed to do what I needed to do to look at things because otherwise, um, well, to put it bluntly, I was going to be a bit of a nightmare uh, to live with and work with. So, you know, you can't live and work with people effectively if you're in a constant flight mode, you know. So yeah, so our mano niema processes, our personality has an impact on others. They're not, it's not just my mano niema processes, not just my personality 
um, it has an impact on others and it has an impact on the order. So I realized I really needed to take responsibility for that. And part of taking responsibility is to distinguish in my experience, what's the difference between karma and vipaka? So karma means action. Um, and vipaka means the fruit of action. So what is just happening to me is a certain sort of weight of being or weight of conditions. You know, what is it that's just set up by previous actions and I can't do anything about it? What kind of preferences of mind are just due to previous actions? And what am I actually creating now? So I have a tendency of mind. I have a certain preference of mind. I have a habitual groove in my being and, and a habit kicks into action. But what I do about that now is my responsibility. And sometimes it's just, I found it was just enough for me to say, I'm not gonna do that anymore. Um, so uh, when, when I looked at the Myers-Briggs test, um, it's, it has this thing about being in the grip. So every personality has got a, a mode that they go into when they're in the grip. So when they're under high stress. And when I'm in the grip, my personality type feels alone and unappreciated and unable to express their distress to others. I'd add in that, unable to express their distress to others in a, in a um, coherent and useful manner. <laughs> I think I expressed a lot of my distress, but not very helpfully. So, um, yeah, so, you know, sometimes it was just, I could see myself sort of cranking myself up like a little child, you know, just about to have a tantrum and just say, I don't need to do that anymore. Um, uh, I even made up this joke, which um, the community wholeheartedly uh, took up, which was I started, I think he's laughing at me, it was just I started singing this song from Handel's Messiah, where he, <laughs> he goes, he was despised, rejected and rejected. <laughs> Anyway, so yes, so as you can hear Vandan Jyoti joining in on that, um, <laughs> the despised, rejected of women. Um, so, you know, sometimes it just needs like a bit of, I'm not going to do that anymore, and a bit of a sense of humour. Um, and uh, I have to say my therapist was very good at that as well. She could see when I was about to crank up into something, she'd say, hmm, I don't really believe in catharsis, <laughs> and look really bored. <laughs> So sometimes you can do it like that. Sometimes you can do it with a bit of humor. And um, I think also I realize about myself, I've just got into a habit of unhappiness, but actually I'm not particularly unhappy. And then there's nothing really to be that unhappy about, but I've just got into this habit. It's kind of a habitual mode. And then when I realized that, I just decided not to do it anymore. And um, my partner was, was very good at this. He said, uh, he said, well, no wonder you're depressed. You always dress like you're in mourning. Maybe you should just wear brighter colors. <laughs> so, so I thought, oh yeah, no, I think he's got a point actually. I bought myself an extremely girly dress. Um, so there's ways we can do it like that, where it's a bit like, you can just not get into that. You can decide not to do it. But I don't think that works with everything. I think sometimes we need deeper work. We need forgiveness and love, we need kind attention. Um, we need to be able to befriend those parts of ourselves that we find uncomfortable so that we don't act them out. In the end, I think what this is, is um, this quality of apamada. I've been thinking about apamada a lot, which um, we usually translate as ethical heedfulness, but I think it's a kind of protector. I think it's a kind of protector of um, watching what's going on in our minds, watching what's going on in my mind, and just gently steering me in the right direction, a kind of watchfulness. Um, it's even got a kind of image in my mind, Apamada, of this very kind of mature, grown up person who's just there, very kind, very gentle, but very, very clear and direct, just steering me. Um, into something more positive. So we're responsible, but we're also creative. So Panti talks about creativity. And um, I think we have to sort of look at how much 
you know, there's a certain amount of our personalities that we're just going to be in, in this lifetime. And there's a certain amount we can change. Um, so, you know, if we continually act with positive karma, um, we'll set up a new kind of the park or we'll set up a new fruits. But what those fruits will be, we don't always know. And we're not going to know in advance. I think what we have to do is trust in conditions. Um, what I have to do is trust in my conditions. I've been practicing for a long time, very, very sincerely. I really don't doubt my practice. I trust my practice. It has an effect, but I don't really understand what the effect will be. It's sort of, it has an effect despite myself. If I keep putting myself in these conditions, something will happen. But what that thing is, is, is none of my business. My job is to practice the precepts and the rest is none of my business. Who will I be? I don't worry about it. The thing that I need to worry about is practicing the precepts. What my personality is, is none of my business. It will change according to the precepts. The only preoccupation that I need to have is am I practicing the precepts and am I practicing the Dharma wholeheartedly? The rest of the Parker is none of my business. So yes, you know, we'll always have a personality. You know, Sangharachita talks about his, um, Sangharachita one and two, you know, this kind of conflict between the monk, um, uh, the philosopher and the artist, the poet. Um, and you know, how he worked with that kind of personality over the years. The Buddha had his own personality and it's thanks to his personality that the Dharma was able to spread. Um, he was very clear and articulate. He was very warm. Um, he was he said he was very handsome, which also helped the spread of the Dharma. So, yeah, so it's being creative in terms of practicing the precepts, but also losing the narrative. You know, I think I can have a very strong narrative about my life. But what I've noticed is that whenever I do my life story, for example, it's different every time. Um, the, what comes to the foreground is different every time. My perspective is different every time. So, you know, even our own perspective on our lives is conditioned and will change. And in the end, um, we've got to do something more than just taking responsibility for our conditioning. Um, even something more than awareness and creativity with our personality. In the end, I think we have to let go of the whole structure. There's a, a Zen teacher called Brad Warner who says, you know, with our personality, he says it's not just about chopping off the moldy end of the carrot and keeping the good bits. In the end, we have to just look at the whole structure of carrot. We have to look at the whole structure of personality and let it go. Let it go into something much bigger. Uh, letting go of that kind of attachment and identifying and clinging to our own personality and realize that our personality is just the play of conditions. Um, as Yeshe Sogil said in the reading last night, we leap beyond and through to perfect creativity, run and roll through the fields of appearance, disappear and fly up into space. So I'll just end again with Yeshe Sogyal and the, the reading that I had at the beginning. From the beginning, I have given my body to the Lama. Whatever will happen, happiness or misery, the Lama knows. From the beginning, I have given my speech to the pure Dharma. Whether my breath will continue to flow or not, only you now know. From the beginning, I have directed my mind towards virtue whether it is virtuous or not, only you now know.